So welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today I have John Jan. Hi, John. Hey, thanks, Adrian, for having me. Welcome back to the show. It's been 18 months since the Commitment Engine, I think, where it came out uh, back in December 2012, I think. I think that is right. It, uh, it's hard to believe it took me that long to write another book. <laughs> um, so for the benefit of our new listeners and readers, and you know, hopefully we've got some loyal ones that have stuck around for the last kind of 18 months, but for the new people, can you give us a quick thumbnail on a bit about you and the work that you do? Well, sure. I have a company uh, in the U.S. called uh, Duct Tape Marketing, and I actually started my own marketing consulting business, and that's essentially what duct tape marketing is, uh -huh. uh, over 25 years ago uh, in kind of the traditional, or at least what I'd seen the traditional fashion. And I found that I really enjoyed working with small businesses particularly, uh, but uh, I also found them to be a bit challenging because I wanted to do all the things I'd done with uh, rather large businesses, but they didn't have the same budget or the same attention span, even in some cases. Sure. And so uh, about the year, just after 2002 or so, I decided that uh, really to solve that frustration for myself, I would create uh, this kind of turnkey approach to marketing where I could walk into a small business and say, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what you're going to do. Here are the results we hope we can expect. And by the way, here's what it uh, costs. And I think that uh, uh, when I, uh, you know, as I said, I set out to solve my own frustration. Frustration. It turns out uh, I, I was actually addressing a major frustration with a lot of small business owners that uh, it's very difficult to buy, or at least in a smart way, marketing yeah. services. Sure. Um, and and so I think that uh, it really that really resonated and took off. And uh, I uh, documented that program, and and that was really the genesis of the term duct tape marketing. I wanted to create something that that was almost product like, uh, or at least uh, a name of a system, you know, rather than just uh, something that, that I did. Mm -hmm. um, and I started writing about that and uh, blogging, and that took off, and that turned into books. And now I have a network of independent marketing consultants uh, actually around the world that uh, that install the duct tape marketing system. Fantastic. Now, on the back of the commitment engine, as, as we mentioned, that we talked about back in December 2012, you've just written a new book called Duct Tape Selling. Think like a marketeer, sell like a superstar. And apparently that's coming out on the 15th of May. Uh, right, that's right, yes? Yes, absolutely. If that's so, right. Thank you. So tell me a bit about the book, uh, how it came about, and what was its purpose? Well, I, I started initially to write that book because of what I'd seen uh, so many of the people that, that sell for a living. You know, that job has become – well, it's certainly become different uh, and in a lot of ways very difficult uh, because people have so many ways on their own now to get information and, and to block out unwanted messages and people sure. uh, that, that they don't want calling them. So a lot of, of salespeople who continue to try to sell in kind of the old-fashioned knocking on doors and – Cold calling and and uh, you know following up on leads that marketing gave them. I, I think we're really struggling. And so what what I uh, attempted to do with this book was write kind of the, the game plan for for now how I think uh, a professional uh, in sales really has to operate. And it borrows heavily from many of the uh, successful things that we've seen go on in in what a lot of people are calling inbound marketing, um, the content marketing, uh, social participating in social media. Uh, but I think that they have a, a, a very different path in some ways. And, and I think that uh, you know it, it would be a shame if a lot of uh, salespeople just said, "Oh, I'm just going to do what I'm just going to do like marketing," uh, because I think that the real opportunity with salespeople is to build kind of a personal brand for expertise and, and authority, and and really personalize. I mean, that's that's one of the challenges. I think that uh, you know everybody's jumped on the content bandwagon, and so now we're all drowning in it. And I, I think that you know now a salesperson's job in in relation to content is to help somebody make sense of it or personalize it. And so the, the, this book is really meant to be kind of the roadmap for that, but. I'll tell you an interesting ha thing happened on the way to writing this book and now promoting this book is I think I definitely addressed that uh, more personalized approach uh, to selling that, that borrows on a lot of the, the, the newer marketing ideas. Uh, but it also uh, turns out that a lot of business owners and marketers and people that are doing sales training sure. um, have really looked at this as this is really truly the, the more personal way to market a business. And, and certainly from a small business uh, point of view, I'm, I mean, even though a lot of small businesses say they have marketing, a lot of them truly are just sales organizations. They go out and sell a product and they, they do very little marketing actually uh, sure. in the truest sense of the word and and I think this book uh, turns out uh, might actually be quite helpful in with, with that type of organization as well absolutely no. so in the book you also talk about sort of, you know changing the context of selling I mean why do you think that they need to why do salespeople need to change the context is it because 
Is it because the customer context is changing or has changed, do you think? Yeah, I, I say that quite a bit. I mean, the, the art of selling has changed uh, dramatically because the art of buying has changed dramatically. And 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 yeah. so, you know, the, the, if you remain that salesperson who is, you know, called in to, you know, probe for solutions and, and close the deal, uh, you will always kind of be thought of as, as a pest, maybe in some cases a necessary pest, uh, but but certainly not a, a somebody that I look forward to having or that, that I think feel brings value, you know, over and above uh, connecting me to the solution. And so when I talk about changing the context, I, I believe the real opportunity is for salespeople to, to, to really be, be looked at as a trusted guide or, or almost consultant, yeah. uh, if you will, to organizations by demonstrating that they bring value over and above uh, certainly anything that they might represent or sell and, and that they're willing to uh, to really be an advocate for me and for me to help uh, help help me discover problems and challenges I don't even know um, that I need or that I'm not even considering right now. And I think that that is the great opportunity, I think, for, for really any marketer, but certainly any salesperson. I think, yeah, and I think that's interesting because you mentioned a word there called, uh, well, called trust. And I think that's that's probably at the heart of it. I mean, I think content from marketing departments can go so far in that it helps people build that, if you like, that initial What's, it's almost like a, a film of trust, but it's actually when you personalize things. And when yeah, you and, and one of the ways that you really build trust, I think, is to demonstrate value. Sure. Uh, and and so, you know, if marketing is putting out a series of trend, you know, blog posts on trends in, in XYZ industry, I think the salesperson who can take that and say, here's the one paragraph that really applied to you, Bill, um, is – and, and can say, hey, we were talking about this issue. You know, here are three pieces of content uh, that I think really get at the heart of that. I mean, that's that to me is how a salesperson can really add value, whether they ever write a word of content themselves uh, around this topic uh, of content. And, and again, I, I I think if you're useful, uh, you people will always trust to bring you in. Sure. So does that mean do you think that that salespeople need to are going to need to develop new skills, or are they just going to find have to find different ways of actually using the tools and the information around them to to adapt it and adapt their approach to the to the customers that they're dealing with? Well, I think there's a couple answers to that. I think definitely yes. Um, salespeople that that get a rash when they think about writing <laughs> or that uh, they think social media is a complete waste of time um, or that don't like to get up and speak in front of large audiences and prefer to kind of do one-on-one. -on -one. To me, um, those are skills that in the in the new world of selling, um, at least in, in the context of, of what I believe is the new world of selling, mm -hmm. uh, are extremely important. But, but I think that there's another issue. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of organizations – uh, need to rethink who they hire or who they consider uh, as a salesperson because of, because of that new school skill set uh, that, that's necessary. I think the the days of of hiring people that seem really outgoing and persuasive and and you know love to build relationships. Um, I think those are all skills that that might play a role, but I think that um, being more analytical. Um, Taking the time, somebody that, that really enjoys doing research, somebody that enjoys writing, somebody that enjoys serving. Yeah. <laughs> these are these are really skills, uh, soft and hard, uh, that I think we need to be looking for in the people that we actually hire with that primary responsibility. I mean, and I, I also see that there's a there's another sort of buzzword of or buzzwords are floating around, and that people, some people have been talking about social selling. Is this a similar sort of like? thing that you're that you're talking about yeah that's a, that's definitely an element of what i'm talking about and i, and I think unfortunately it, as you said anytime something becomes a buzzword or gets hyped i mean you can count on it being misinterpreted um as well and i think for a lot of people they are you know they're they're basically saying oh well that means i need to be on linkedin um and, and yeah. you know it's it's much it's much deeper than that and in fact i think uh what's interesting and i've made this statement to groups of marketers uh, really uh, countless times now is that I think marketing, marketing people have actually to some degree ruined social media for some people because they have turned it into another broadcast channel. Sure. Whereas I think in the hands of a salesperson who doesn't care how many followers he or she has but, but uses it as a tool to understand the world, the entire world of the 20 people that they care about and uses it as a tool to connect other people mm -hmm. to those 20 people, I think it's a tremendous uh, tool. And, and that's really what um, I, I think that the opportunity in social selling, I mean, my 
first job out of college, uh, and 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 my mentor really was my father, who who every day got up and and got in the car and drove off to the next town and went around the square and sold the hardware store and sold the, um, and and you know he 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 did social selling right, but it was it was before we had you know LinkedIn and before we had any of these tools. For him, what it meant was was showing up and and uh, doing what you said you were going to do, finding ways to help uh, his customers get more of what they wanted, even if even if it. And I can't tell you how many times he used to tell me stories about how he didn't take an order from somebody because he knew X Y Z company had a better product uh, or better better solution for what that person needed, and and he saw his role as really being the advocate for his customer and not necessarily for his company, um, and 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 certainly felt that the long term approach. Of of making sure that that he got them the right solution was always going to pay off, and I think that now when we talk about social selling, to me it's 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 really those same things of, of focusing on delivering value. But now you have this rich tool set in which to you know to understand a client's world, to understand their needs, to understand what they're measured on, um, and and if you're not using those again, not for and that's the part that I think is a little challenging is, is a lot of people just see it as, oh, look, now I can get access to this person so I can go cold call them, right? Sure. And and that's not that's not the point of this at all. It's how can I use these tools to, to, to in some ways, do a better job at what I'm already doing or already should be doing. And, and that, to me, is the essence of social selling. Yeah. But it also seems to me, listen to what, what you were saying in, in terms of like what traditional sales departments or salespeople have done and what traditional marketing departments have done. But there, there's also – the, there's the best salespeople, like you talk about your father, and then there's the best marketing departments. And it seems that, that almost like the future sales, the, the requirements for a future, the future salesperson and the requirements for a future uh, marketing person, it's almost like they could learn a lot from each other. Well, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was talking about the different audiences that, that have been attracted to this book. Um, I'm doing at least three presentations over the next uh, few months on to large organizations about uh, the idea of bringing sales and marketing together. And I think that in a lot of ways, this melding of inbound marketing, of inbound selling, and even outbound marketing, I, I think it's kind of that point in the middle where those things come together that the customer is actually served the best. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that, unfortunately – what I'm talking about and why that topic is, is so in demand is I think that it's going to actually require a pretty significant cultural shift in a lot of organizations because sure. there's there's always been kind of this uh, marketing opposed to sales and and you know I finally uh, had some salespeople um, articulate why that is because it never really made sense to me in some cases how can you have you know marketing and sales don't they have the same objectives well it turns out they don't <laughs> um, in a lot of organizations you know a lot of uh, marketing departments uh, their charge is to generate leads don't really care what leads how what quality you know right. uh, just number of leads and of course sales objective or how they're measured is closed deals and so obviously those two things don't always serve each other. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's a great part of the disconnect. So I spent a lot of time in this book talking about you know, how inbound selling, uh, instead of just the, the sales department going, okay, now we're going to do inbound selling and social selling, uh, it needs to be an extension of, of inbound marketing and, and of the social platform or social behavior that, that the marketing department is, is also uh, putting out there. And there's no way to do that, no way to integrate that as fully as it should be to serve the, the journey that the customer needs to go down uh, without those two departments working together very early on. To, uh, I think the, that sales and marketing should be jointly defining who makes an ideal client. I think sales and marketing should be jointly defining you know, what our core you know, message is or what our proposition to the market is. And, and I definitely think sales and marketing should be working together to develop an editorial calendar that 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 would create content that the market wants, but also uh, help create content that the individual salesperson could use as a tool. I think that's absolutely right, but I also think I mean I would suggest that that, it, that sort of convergence or combining of the two departments. I think to make it work, you probably need to go back uh, back a little bit further and actually think about the overall purpose of the business. I mean, if I think sure. about your your father. And you talk about how he would always just do the best thing for the customer, even if that meant recommending somebody else's products. And it just, it's almost a bit like we have to almost take ourselves and our, our own sort of targets out of the equation and think about what, why are we here and what yeah. are we here to do, I guess. Well, and, and that's right. And, and you know, you mentioned my previous book, The Commitment Engine. I spent sure. a great deal of time talking about that idea that that, that that's 
truly the starting point or should be for any business. Why do we do what we do? Um, and and why would anybody care? And who could we attract that, <laughs> that believes in that mission? And obviously, if a company started there, uh, I think you wouldn't have some of the cultural divide that maybe you, maybe you see in a lot of organizations. Yeah. So if, if I was a business and I was <clears throat> adopting this type of approach and making this successful, could I expect to see, do you think, an impact on customer or client retention and loyalty by taking this approach rather than it just being all about how much I'm going to get, get paid from you this month? Yeah, I, I, I believe so, but but we haven't really touched on the, 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 a big piece that I talk about and I have talked about in a lot of my work is something I call the marketing hourglass. Right. And and the idea behind that is that, that – you know, we we want to. Uh, I think a lot of organizations want to guide, not only guide, but force the journey. That to me, the the marketing funnel is all about saying, "Hey, come in here. Marketing will send you some content, and then sales will come out and call on you. You know, once they score you high enough, and yeah. and then you'll pop out the other end of the funnel as a loyal customer." Yeah. And uh, what I believe is that 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 you know suggests that that people you know buy in the same way they you know bought 50 years ago, and and we know that that's not the case now, and there is no kind of linear path anymore. People uh, people come to us and find out about us and learn about us and decide to buy from us in ways that we no longer have any control over, or maybe don't even know are happening. Sure. Um, and and so I think that the the idea behind the marketing hourglass is that we uh, what we need to do instead of trying to create demand is to organize behavior. Yeah. Um, and and what I mean by that is that that you know people want to come to you know the the, the seven stages that I talk about the seven behaviors that I pe I believe people want to participate in with the companies they do business with are are no like trust. Yeah. Try, buy, repeat, and refer. Yeah. And so your entire sales and marketing and service uh, processes all need to be built um, with a with a very intentional idea of moving people through those uh, behaviors, or at least allowing people to uh, to go on a journey through those behaviors. So, so consequently, if you are doing that approach, um, that then certainly the sales not a sale until the customer gets a result, and that you have very intentional processes to uh, to go back and measure that and and. And, and certainly, you know, that experience, blending kind of that whole sales and marketing and service experience into, into one customer journey um, is how you uh, certainly ramp up retention and, and certainly generate more referrals. I think that's, I mean, yeah, I completely agree with that. But I also think that, that an, an important point that many companies seem to forget as well is that it's the customer's journey, it's not theirs. Yeah. Yeah, and then if you think about us as human beings, we just don't like to be rushed or be told what to do. Sometimes we just, you know, we are on our own journey, uh, doing things at our own pace. And if we get rushed along, then it's all, that's not the way that you engender sort of trust and, uh, you know, with somebody. No. Yeah, and there's a there's a couple statistics that I cite in the book from a, a really extensive research study from uh, the. Um, CEB, which is uh, they, they've changed their name, and I can't remember the name now. <laughs> now but CEB okay. is, yeah. um, and so they did uh, 2,200 uh, B2B companies, and they found that 50 percent, 57 percent of those companies claimed that that they made a decision, a purchase decision on a product or service um, prior to ever contacting the company. Yeah. So you know that. So talk about the customer journey. <laughs> you know, having a, a different path because we certainly have the ability to do that now. Uh, we don't really need the company or their salesperson just to show up and give us information. But what's interesting is um, that that uh, another nugget in that survey was that fifty three percent of those same companies also said that the the determination to remain loyal to a company or to buy from a company again was dictated by the sales experience alone. Sure. Um, and that that if that wasn't congruent or if, or if that didn't match um, what uh, um, you know their expectation was uh, that they were not going to remain loyal. So it, I think it really sets up this idea that certainly we have to be marketing has to be putting that information out there, be they breadcrumbs or whatever we want to call them, so that somebody can go on that journey uh, quite often by themselves or, or at least unknown to us. Uh, but then we have to actually really have a process, uh, a sales process, then. That uh, that that has value and that creates a remarkable experience. Fantastic. So, if I was listening into this podcast and I was I ordered your you know your book, but it was it was in the post and it was coming because this person say wants to read the the paper copy rather than have an, an instant gratification via Kindle. Yes. And you wanted to give their, them as their sales manager or salesperson. What would your advice be to them if they wanted to 
embark take the first step embark on this journey towards a modern a more modern approach to to selling what would you say to them well i think that oh boy the the, the individual salesperson that's a tough question because obviously the first thing i would say to them is you know read this book and then take it to your sales manager okay. to you know tell them why you thought to hey we ought to be doing some of this stuff here um but if if as you said uh we're on, the, the book's on a slow boat and uh, it's coming across the channel somewhere uh that then i would say um start uh, look at your best customers. Yeah. And and if if so, you have a week or so uh, to uh, to spend. Um, first off, try to figure out you know what makes your best customers your best customers. Are there some characteristics or are there certain situations they have, certain way they like to buy? I mean, there are many behaviors that, that can go into that. Um, and then maybe sit down. See if five or six of them will sit down with you uh, individually, or you can do it over the phone. Um, and and just ask them a few questions about you know why they buy from you, why they stay with you. If it, and and hopefully your best customers are referring you already. You know why do they refer you, and when they do, you know what do they say? And again. Not so much. This doesn't have to be about the company. This can be about you individually. I mean, and try to what you're trying to do is to get a sense of what your personal brand is and yeah. and how you're showing up and you know why what pe- what you do uh, that people really value. And and again, sometimes it can just be that your company has a great product. They have a great process. Uh, you you know you do what you say you're going to do. Uh, but but you really want to dig deep and and try to get a sense of of some of the things you're doing that your best customers uh, really enjoy because uh, you. You want to surface as much of, of that type of, of kind of brand, personal brand information, because uh, that that needs to be what you start taking out there and, and telling other people uh, that you're going to do for them. I think that's um, you know some people might be um, might be listening to that and going, oh, I can't do that because that's all to do with that sort of you know the social phobia, kind of like asking yeah. people what you really think of, think about them and things right. like that. But I yeah, guess they might they might actually, they might actually tell, me. tell me. Well, exactly, they might actually <laughs> tell me. So I think we have to quote, was it Susan Jeffers now and say like, feel the fear and do it anyway? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. That was, that's an oldie. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So John, I'm just interested, just watching time because I know that you've got a, uh, you've got to go in a, in a couple of minutes, but just sort of in wrapping up, is there anything that you would like to add before I ask you my final question. You know, every, a lot of people have been trained to ask that question, and I always feel like I just show up and blabber everything. I everything I've got to say, I don't ever hold anything back. So when when I get that, is there anything you want to add? Question. I, I you know I never know what to say other than buy buy one hundred copies and give them to all 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 of your friends. Well, then that, that? Then, then then my last question was is that you would like to shamelessly plug? And then, <laughs> yeah. and well, then I, I guess, guess I already did it. Didn't you? I guess you already, yeah, already yeah, did. Yeah. So I, I will say that one of the kind of neat things we did is we have it. We do have a site for the book uh, okay. just for the book ducttapeselling.com and one of the things that anybody who's read any of my material knows um, I love to cite lots of tools and resources and, and very practical approaches to doing things and, and so probably have a, somewhere over 200 companies and individuals and, and tools um, that and services that, that I talk about throughout the book and I, I built uh, on the ducttapeselling.com page we built a resources um, tab where it goes chapter by chapter, you have all the links to those companies. And I know a lot of people when they, I know myself when I read a book, and I'm constantly saying, "Oh, I'm going to go check that out later." Well, now you can read the book and have that uh, tab up and and just you know click away to your heart's uh, content. Fantastic! That's that's amazing, John. I'll I'll make sure I get all that sort of linked up and get, um, edited up and give you a big shout out when the. Um when the book goes uh, live here in the UK. <laughs> but I just want to say thank you for your time today. That's been great. Oh, oh it's my pleasure. All right. All right. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye.